At what point in your time after, you know, you, you come to America for the second time after, after West Africa, it, did you feel called at what point to, to, to enlist, to, to join the military, to be part of it? Well, it was actually in, in Africa that I, I um, had the yearning to serve because in 1979, when the Shah of Iran was overthrown, the Marines gathered us all to the embassy because it was a Muslim country. They were afraid it was going to be a huge Muslim uprising around the world. And so the Marines stood watch over us to protect us. And I wanted to be like those men. I wanted to be like those brave men who stood on that wall carrying a rifle and says, nothing's going to touch you tonight, not on my watch. And that's, that's where I, I want to be like those guys. Like, I mean, I speak three languages. I have a master's in physics. I have a bachelor's in engineering. I could have done anything I wanted to do. But I wanted to serve this country because I loved what it stood for. Welcome to the Michelle Tafoya podcast. So welcome and please don't forget to subscribe. Just hit that subscribe button if you're listening on Spotify or Apple iPods or watching on YouTube. Just subscribe. That way you never miss an episode. It's rare that you run into a political candidate that you really want to cheer for. And we have one today that I feel strongly about. And not even in my state. I can't vote for this guy. But as he will say later in the interview, he will vote for you. He's running for U.S. Senate as the GOP candidate in Virginia. He's got a book coming out in June called Call Me an American. This is a guy who was born in South Vietnam during the Vietnam, Vietnam War, uh, ended up in West Africa with his family for a time, and has since become a United States citizen and a very proud one. He served in the military all over the world, protecting American interests. Uh, he's extremely well-educated and he's running for Senate. And this is the kind of guy who really believes in the American dream, in American values. And I, I had to talk to him. I never met him before, but he is obviously very well supported and well-financed in Virginia based on everything that I'm seeing. So this is a guy who could wind up in the Senate and someone that you may want to support from afar. As he says, he'd like to support you uh, from afar. He wants he wants to serve. It seems to me his whole life has been cut out for service. His name is Hung Kao, originally, like I said, from South Vietnam, speaks three languages, Vietnamese, English, and French fluently. Uh, you're going to meet him and you're going to think, what a soft-spoken, nice man. But this guy's been through the grind and he knows a thing or two that you may not know about how close we came to war with North Korea. A lot to listen to here. Hung Kao, our guest next. The book is Call Me an American, and he'll tell you why he entitled it that. Coming up. Hung, welcome. You and I have never met before, never spoken, uh, but it, it, it comes to me on pretty respectable authority what kind of person you are, and, I, and I'm excited to talk to you and introduce you to the audience. Um, first of all, I'd like to get into where you were born and how you got to America. So let's start with where were you born? Oh, thank you, Michelle. Uh, so I was born in Vietnam and let's go back to 1973. The U.S. Uh, pulled out all its troops, but the South Vietnamese were still fighting valiantly against the North Vietnamese. Uh, but then in 1975, a young senator by the name of Joe Biden, his first vote in the Senate was to stop all funding to South Vietnam, which caused the entire country to collapse. My father was a high ranking South Vietnamese official. He was the deputy minister of agriculture. And because of that, he would have been marked for death or sent to a re-education camp. So my parents had to make hard decisions. They, they had to uh, decide how to get out of the country. My mom was sewing notes into our clothes and a little money saying, this is my son, please take care of him. And that next morning, when they went to the airport, they had the sudden fear and resolution. What, what if the Americans only took in two of our five kids or three of our five kids? Who do we leave behind? And how do we, how did they take care of themselves? And how do we even come back and get them? But by the grace of God, we made it to the United States and just you know, you, the, just the kids. You no, know, us all, all five, all seven all, of us. All the, the five kids and our okay. parents. Yes. Yeah. So we made it here and, um, we, we, uh, came to Northern Virginia. But then my dad, again, could not find work over here. And he's too proud to go on government subsidies like food stamps or anything like that. So 
the next job he could find was in West Africa, developing third world countries. And so we picked up and moved to Niger and, you know, these, the sub-Saharan desert. And we lived there for seven years. And then my parents had to make another hard decision. Like, Hey, this kid doesn't speak any English because I went to French schools and I spoke Vietnamese at home. And so my mom and dad had to, uh, basically, uh, by, uh, you know, geographically separate my, uh, he would come home and visit us every six months. And my mom would take us back to the United States where we, uh, you know, I learned English and, you know, learned to speak without a, an accent. So kids didn't make fun of me. And I, the rest is, uh, history. Were kids making fun of you initially? Oh yeah. I mean, it's kids, kids are just mean altogether. You know, like you, they make fun of your clothes cause you're, you're hang, wearing hand-me-down clothes because uh, we couldn't afford much. You know, we, we weren't very rich. We, 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 uh, my dad made do with what we, he had, you know, there's no such thing as mold where I came from and on bread, you just cut it out and eat around it, you know, uh, you, you know, or bread's a little stale. You put a little water on it and you bake it and it, it's just fine. This is before microwaves too. I, I'm smiling and laughing because I come from depression era parents who were the same way, you know, just cut that mold off the edge of the cheese. It's fine. It's like, wow. Exactly. Or you put yeah. a little water in this uh, shampoo and make it last a little longer. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Uh, so humble beginnings, definitely. Um, and you're learning three languages along the way. Are you born into the Vietnamese language? What do you, what is your earliest memory of America? Um, the earliest memory was our, uh, our sponsors, uh, the Fitzgeralds. They, they had a family of nine kids and they took in our family of five kids, you know, and it was just, it was crowded in there, but there's one, uh, one of the sons, Mike, who has, who continues to be a good friend. He would take us out for ice cream and, you know, um, he had this huge Cadillac convertible. His dad would always say, you know, Oh, fancy guy with a fancy car, but he would always take us. It was such a treat. That's what I remember about, you know, America is these generous people who, you know, took care of us and brought us into their home for a few months so we can get settled and, uh, you know, gave us all the nice things like American ice cream and, and just being able to, to hang out in the, uh, in their backyard. How much culture shock between the three places did you experience as a youngster do, uh, that you can remember? Well, um, I think the, the culture shock is really the going from Africa to America. I mean, uh, that was more of a French culture. It's African and then all French cultures. And coming to America, I mean, uh, there's a lot of sarcasm in Americans. Uh, there, there's something, you know, you, what, the same word or phrase can mean this two different things, right? And and so, uh, just just the tonality of how you say things, and and you know, when you're taking everything very literally, and kids, you know, make fun of you for that, and that's that's really the way it is. Uh, uh, I think that's the biggest culture shock. But I mean, again, America is really the greatest country in the world, and, and I'm, I'm proud to be an American. When did you become a citizen? Uh, seven years after we um, we came to the United States. Uh, so I think 1982 was when my dad became uh, an American citizen. And, you know, he was so proud that the last thing he had hang over his bed when he passed away two years ago was his naturalization certificate. That's how much we love being Americans and proud being Americans. It's interesting because when people think of the Vietnam War, I think they often think of the Americans as part of the the evil and the problem there. I'm guessing you don't see it that way. How do you see it? No, I mean, these men sacrificed. They were called to action by their government, by, by the American government, and they, they answered. My my wife's three uncles um, all have, you know, complications or have died. Two of them have died already um, from Agent Orange and other uh, problems from the war. I mean, these young men were... Are, are the age of my children right now. Some of my children and, and they, they, there was a call and they went out and they answered that call. So, I mean, my biggest, honestly, my biggest supporters are some of the POWs. Um, Everett Alvarez, who's the longest serving POW in uh, Vietnam. I mean, this man was tortured for years, tortured. And, and he's coming behind me as, as really just, saying, hey, you know, my, my sacrifice was worth something because this young man came here and he had life for the sacrifice I made in, in the country. That's amazing. That is, that is a remarkable story. At what point in your 
time after you know you, you come to America for the second time after after West Africa. It, did you feel called at what point to to, to enlist to, to join the military to be part of it? Well, it was actually in in Africa that I I um, had the yearning to serve because in 1979 when the Shah of Iran was overthrown. The Marines gathered us all to the embassy because it was a Muslim country. They were afraid it was going to be a huge Muslim uprising around the world. And so the Marines stood watch over us to protect us. And I wanted to be like those men. I wanted to be like those brave men who stood on that wall carrying a rifle and says, nothing's going to touch you tonight, not on my watch. And that's that's where I, I want to be like those guys. Like, I mean, I speak three languages. I have a master's in physics. I have a bachelor's in engineering. I could have done anything I wanted to do. But I wanted to serve this country because I loved what it stood for. All right, I want to tell you about my friends at besthotgrills.com. Besthotgrills.com. Big believer in this product. And with Father's Day and graduation coming up, this would make a great, great gift. Besthotgrill.com recommends the gifts of great grilling and healthy eating. If you've got a mom, dad, or grad you want to honor, well, do it with a gift that's going to be used. It will be unforgettable and truly hot. And that would be a Solaire Infrared Grill from besthotgrill.com. Solaire Infrared Grills heat up to 1,000 degrees in just three minutes and produce juicy, tasty food unmatched by conventional grills. I'll tell you from personal experience, phenomenal. You might also be taken to the road or having a staycation. Solaire has hot and fast portable built-in and cart models to help you step up your grilling. All Solaire infrared grills are made in the USA and built to last. More importantly, Solaire infrared grills deliver the wow that everybody likes to receive in a gift or major purchase. Learn more about the amazing Solaire infrared grills at besthotgrill.com. That's besthotgrill.com. Solaire infrared gift giving at besthotgrill.com. I want to be like those brave men who stood on that wall carrying a rifle and says, nothing's going to touch you tonight, not on my watch. And that's that's where I, I want to be like those guys. Like, I mean, I speak three languages. I have a master's in physics. I have a bachelor's in engineering. I could have done anything I wanted to do, but I wanted to serve this country because I loved what it stood for. Holy moly, I was tearing up there. That's... <laughs> That is a the picture you just painted is amazing, um, of a of a young kid looking up to these American soldiers who are protecting them, and I got to imagine that you see now here you, you, you're an American citizen, you've served, you're running for office, and you see the the way the police officers are treated, the morale among the police officers who who want to do the same thing, uh, they, they want to protect and serve. What goes through your mind when you see some of this stuff that is happening to these officers? It's it's heartbreaking. So I spent four years on the FBI's Joint Terrorism Task Force. I work with uh, San Diego sheriffs and San Diego uh, Police Department. And up in Monterey, I was asked to stand up the bomb squad when I was there for uh, my graduate studies. And I stood up a bomb squad there. I helped with the uh, Virginia Beach Police Department. So I... A lot of people say they support the blue, but I literally actually did support the blue. And these men and women bravely walk out there. Like when I'm on patrol in Iraq or Afghanistan or Somalia, once I leave the wire, I know to be on. These men and women are on all the time. Whether they are on duty or not, they, you, you'll notice police officers will never sit with their backs to the, uh, to the door. They, they, they're always on call. They're always on watch because – they swore a duty to serve and protect. And these young men and women uh, who, who are, you know, like Antifa and now these, this pro Hamas groups, I mean, they, it, it just breaks my heart. They have no idea what they're protesting for or, or protesting against saying defund the police. I mean, it's, it's borderline criminal and, you know, the police don't like it as much as I don't like it, but we know we did our job because Anywhere else in the world they do this, they would have gotten a bullet in the head, right? I mean, they can't do this in North Korea or in China or in Russia. They get thrown away in the gulag or anything else. But we did our job because we protected their right for their freedom of speech. 
So now you, you've written a book that's coming out June 11th. You are running for office. It, it seems to me that your patriotism knows no bounds, that you want to continue to serve. What's drawing you to Washington that looks so chaotic right now and so, um, you know, it, 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 it's difficult to run for office when you know that there are just people out there who want to dig into your background, find out anything they can, whether it's even true or not, and, you know, spew the lies or argue, uh, call you names, whatever it is. It's a difficult choice. What's influencing you? You know, this is not my dream. It's never been my dream. It, I feel like it's more of a calling because, um, I mean, I left the career of honor to come to this. And when I saw in Afghanistan, I left Afghanistan in January 2021. And six months later, when mothers were handing babies to Marines, that's very indicative of what happened in Vietnam caused by the same man, the same man who caused Iraq to fall also, because as the vice president of the United States, he went over there to negotiate what's called the status of force agreement. And he failed to do so to protect our troops until we had to pull out. And I watched every night as our troops were getting picked off one by one on the way to Kuwait. And, you know, this man doesn't belong in office. And so the question is, you know, who shall I send? And so, you know, you, you kind of have to say, here I am, Lord, send me. And so you, you answer the call. So I retired from the United States Navy. I ran for Congress actually in 2022. I didn't win. I ran in the 10th Congressional District of Virginia, which includes Loudoun County. And I'm sure a lot of people remember Loudoun County where, you know, the they, they allowed a transgender to go in the bathroom and, and sexually assault a young girl. They allowed the school board to attack the parents. I mean, this is Loudoun County. But you know what? The miracle of that was we took a district that Joe Biden won by 19 points and we took it down to six points. Mm -hmm. We moved that district 13 percent. They believed so much in us that they're willing to put their name and their money and their votes behind us. And that's why we ran for Cong uh, for U.S. Senate right now, because we have a better chance to, to do this. I and mean, again, it's not what we want to do. You, you said it right. They call you all sorts of names. In fact, that's why the name the book is named the way it is, because the woman I ran against in 2022 called me a bigot. She called me a racist. She called me extremist. She called me a white adjacent, you know, uh, uh, extremist. I mean, she called me these things and it, it was actually inside a mosque where we we're debating. And I said, you know what? I bled for this country. I earned the title of being called an American. And so, you know what? This book is kind of dedicated to her absurdity of calling somebody that not less than a year before she was thanking me for my service. And now she's calling me all sorts of names. And so, you know what? This is, this book is really a love letter to, to America and to my children because it's an, it's a call to action that the American dream is still out there and we can still strive. We may fail here and there, but we're going to keep pushing. You know, at the very heart, the, the very heart and soul of our democracy is the First Amendment, free speech. And it is the cornerstone that supports every other freedom that we cherish. But we're living in a digital age where discussions about our wealth, our rights, and our future are being silenced or overshadowed in mainstream narratives. And that leaves a lot of us feeling voiceless in conversations that are crucial to our financial independence and security. And this is where wealth protection research steps in, armed with a mission that's never been more critical. Wealth protection research is not a financial advisory firm. They're defenders of free speech committed to giving a voice to the silenced. Wealth Protection Research tirelessly seeks out financial experts. These are the voices that challenge prevailing narratives, especially as we navigate the uncertainties of the 2024 election. Wealth Protection Research has created a 2024 election wealth protection report. This free report highlights the three best ideas for protecting and growing your money heading into the 2024 election. It contains ideas the mainstream media won't touch, and listeners can get it completely free by texting IDEAS. I-D-E-A-S, to 76626. If you believe in the sanctity of free speech and the importance of financial freedom, please do this now. Text IDEAS to 76626 to, flame, to claim your free copy of this 2024 election protection report. It is time to widen the scope of what we're told, to hear the ideas the establishment doesn't think you can handle, but you can, 
and to take control of our financial destinies. Text IDEAS to 76626 to claim your free copy. Hung, I want to read from uh, one of the reviews written by Newt Gingrich of your book, Hung Kao's remarkable and inspiring story of how his family survived the defeat in Vietnam, overcame the adversity of having to flee communism and established themselves in a new land of opportunity and freedom is a stunning tribute both to his family and to the America he served in the military. Hung Kao is the kind of energetic, intelligent and cr- courageous leader who will make America a better country. His book is a testimonial to those qualities. I also believe that the American dream is still alive and well. Um, does that guarantee everyone that the same outcome? No, it does not. But when you look at your journey, you have worked and like you said, bled, sweat, cried, given everything, risked your life for this country. Not everyone has to do that. I didn't have to risk my life to throw out the American dream. You know, I had an Hispanic father and, I, and my parents came from the depression and it, they just taught us work ethic. So I guess I would start with, you know, here you're taking this American dream that you've lived out. You're doing something that's going to be very difficult to do in a winning the race and then going to Senate to the Senate. What would you like to see the future of this country look like? I would like for people to understand that the American dream is out there, but you have to roll up your sleeves and work hard. And I want to secure that blessing for my kids, your kids, our grandkids. I mean, this is, this is there for everybody, but you have to work hard and you can't, you can't just say, Oh, I couldn't make it. So I'm going to quit. You got to keep trying because you know, success isn't from never failing. It's from rising after every fall. It's about picking yourself up, dusting yourself off, you know, rub some dirt into the wound and keep going. That's what America is all about. I mean, we, we, you know, modernized the industrial world. We invented the assembly line. We invented the airplane. We put a man on the moon. We can do amazing things in this country if we just let the American people just flourish and go forth and pull big government out of the way. Like government's not there to tell you what to do. In fact, the Constitution tells the government what they're allowed to do. Yeah. But now we have people telling us we have to drive EV cars. We we can't have incandescent light bulbs. We can't have ceiling fans. We can't have gas stoves. I mean, that's ridiculous. That's un-American. And this is why I'm, I'm running for office because I'm sick and tired of this. You know, the government's there to provide for the common defense and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. It doesn't do much more than that. We have to protect this country and and, and keep it going, not not tell the Americans what they can or can't do. The The most recent thing we've seen here in the States that is really, really troubling and should be to everyone, but I, I don't know, are these campus protests, these you could call them anti-Israeli. You can call them pro-Hamas. You can call them ceasefire, pro-Gaza, whatever you want to call them. But it seems to me they're all placing blame on Israel for what for what's going on between Israel and the Palestine the Palestinians right now. Um, you've been in war. You've seen it up close. What's your response to these people? And, and let's acknowledge, like you said, probably a good portion of them don't know what they're talking about and they're just joining in. But there certainly is, Hong, and you know this, there are agitators, there are paid protesters, there are organizers who really would like to divide this country over a variety of issues, race, uh, this one right now, this anti-Semitic movement. If you could speak to them directly, face to face, what would you say? Well, first of all, I think it's interesting. This happens every four years, right? In 2012, we saw the Occupy Wall Street, mm-hmm. and then then 2020, we saw um, we saw the uh, uh, BLM and Tifa, and now we see this, and they're very well funded. But here's what I always ask them: It's like, do you know what happened on October 7th, 2001? And they they want to answer because they're like, no, 2001, no, that's the day we invaded Afghanistan. Do you think anybody? Then could have told us, take it easy on Taliban. You know, they don't, they didn't mean to take down their, your twin towers. No. But what would we do if someone came here and murdered 1200 people, raped women and young girls and threw babies in ovens? I actually commend the Israelis for having the restraint they have because I would have gone scorched earth. There would have been no mercy for me. If someone did that to our people, I, I would level the place. 
but they have been very, very measured. But the problem is Hamas uses Palestinians as human shields. They've done this for years where they build their headquarters underneath hospitals and schools for a reason, because they, they're cowards, they're animals. And you're, so you're, you're saying pro Hamas and you're saying Antifada, but Antifada means a complete destruction of, of all Jews across the world and the only Jewish state, state in, in the world. And so that's, that's where they're uneducated and un, they, they don't know what they're, they're talking about. It's really, it's, it's a little scary. Uh, I, I, and I kind of hope you're right, that this is just one of those little spasms that we have when there's an election coming up. But it is, it, it, then it is, is disturbing that these people are doing this for political purposes only, uh, you know, and not because they are passionate or believe. So if you haven't yet checked out XXXY Athletics, I'm telling you, you need to do so, okay? For a number of reasons. XXXY Athletics is the only athletic brand standing up for the protection of women's sports, which continues to be under attack. Because this is more urgent than ever. You know, Title IX got gutted by the Biden administration. And you're almost seeing women eliminated as a sex-based class. I'm not talking about gender. We're talking about sex here. We're talking about XX versus XY chromosomes. There's no better person on earth to lead this effort than Jennifer Say. She was a world-class gymnast. She exposed abuse in the sport before anyone else, and she suffered for it, but she was right, and she was redeemed in the end. She also stood up for open schools during COVID, and she suffered for it, but she was right again. XXXY Athletics is the culmination of everything Jennifer Say has ever done, standing up for kids, leading Levi's, which is a world-class clothing brand, and being unafraid to say true but unpopular things and taking the heat for it. That's her best asset. If you care about girls and women's sports, check out XXXY Athletics. You'll love the quality, I'm telling you, and the style. You'll be choosing a brand that aligns with your values. Go to xxxyathletics.com. Now, here's what you got to do. You got to go xx-xyathletics.com. That dash has to be in there. Use Michelle75 for free shipping on orders of $75 or more. That's good through the end of June. xx-xyathletics.com. Use the code Michelle75 for free shipping on orders of $75 or more. You're going to love this stuff. xx-xyathletics.com. Um, you have mentioned Joe Biden a few times here today. You talked about him voting for taking all the funding out uh, away from the South Vietnamese uh, fighters. You've talked about him pulling out of Afghanistan, which was an, just an abject failure, a total disaster. Um, how can people possibly like, I, you know, it comes down to people say, I can't vote for Trump. I can't vote for Trump. I can't vote for Biden. And and we have this binary choice. You can throw an RFK Jr., but we know that he can't win numerically. He just can't win. So you, your your vote for him would be wasted. Um, so for me, it's a choice between two men, two people, two humans, two and two philosophies and two different policy sets. And that's what it really comes down to for me. But you seem to have a a, a, a kind of a special. <laughs> Um, place in your, I don't want to call it your heart, but in your mind about Joe Biden and the mistakes that he's made. I can't see how anyone can see him being fit for office, Hung. How, how, how do you make the argument against him best? Look, um, you, you're, you bring it up right. You know, oh, I can't vote for Trump. Why? Well, I don't like his, you know, him, his, what, his tweet, tweets and stuff like that. And I said, listen, the only person that needs to like Donald Trump is Melania. OK, you don't need to like him. You just need to like his policies. When I went to the Pentagon in 2016, I was counting every missile, every bomb, every torpedo for an imminent attack on North Korea. I don't think the country realized how close we were at the brink of war with North Korea. And somehow he came in there and he thwarted that entire situation. He physically went into North Korea. I mean, just the courage of that man walking into really the lion's den wearing a pork chop jacket, right? I mean, he's walking into the lion's den right there and he had the courage to do so. And, and also at the end of his term, he, 
he brought peace in the Middle East through the Abraham Accord. For the first time in my life, I saw peace in the Middle East. And he did that. Uh, we, he brought prosperity. I mean, we were at 1.3% inflation rate. We had so much money. Uh, and so when I wrote the Navy's budget for those two years, we always expected a 2% inflation rate. But with a 0.8% uh, increase, we had all this money to fix the military, to fix the Navy the way it needed to be fixed. We had ships that couldn't get underway, aircrafts that couldn't fly, submarines that couldn't dive. And we were able to take that 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 money that we had uh, basically anticipated for inflation to do that. Not only that, we saved so much money in uh, fuel costs because gasoline was so cheap, oil was so cheap, we were able to to buff up the, the military's budget. And that's how we paid for a lot of the uh, um, the wall systems uh, down in, in the border. I mean, the, the wall system, all everything was bought and procured for, is sitting out there rotting away right now under Joe Biden and actually he was selling some parts, but we were able to use that surplus to buy those things. And, and Joe Biden just opens up the, the border and allows tens of millions of illegal uh, immigrants across the border who are coming in from countries like China, Syria, and Yemen, T uh, you know, tens of thousands of military aged males from those countries here to do, you know, no good for this country. Where can people find you if they want to support you? Oh, please go to hungforva.com. That, that's H-U-N-G-F-O-R-V-A.com. Just remember, you can't vote for me if, if you're not in Virginia, but I can vote for you because my vote in the Senate will help keep them from packing the courts. It's going to keep them from doing these things that are anti-American, that, that are keeping American industry and American businesses down. I, I can vote for you because I, I believe I fought and bled for you. I'm not going to stop fighting. And, you know, unfortunately, I need ammunition. So I asked for people to support me. You know, I, I mean, we've gotten 35,000 donors across the country to support us. And it, it brings a tear in my eye when a widower brings, get, sends me $2 saying this is all I can afford because I'm on pension. I mean, that's biblical in itself right there. What do you like about your chances right now? What do you think is going to happen? We're, we look really good. So right now in Virginia, President Trump and President Biden are neck and neck. And Tim Kaine, even though I have not yet won the primary, it's in less than a month, they, they put my name in there because they, they know that I'm going to be the nominee. I'm within striking this of Tim Kaine. And his, his favorability, basically the, the excitability for him is only at 35%. So basically he's got a point for every... Um, every year he's been in office and I've got a point for every month that I've been uh, running for the seat. And, you know, when you contrast me with him, it, the contrast is very evident. You put us up there on stage. Both of us had a government paycheck for 30 years and he has millions of dollars to show for it. And I have scars. So I ask you who fought for America and who served to protect this country. Yeah. Let's not let the smooth talk of a, of an old politician like Kane, uh, you know, fool you. Let's, I, I want people who are going to do the hard work, who are going to roll up their sleeves, who know the difference between getting stuff done and just winning the office. I, I mean, that, that to me is, is paramount. There are so many people who just want to be in office to be in office. And uh, then there are people who really want to get down to, to work. And you strike me as definitely someone who has worked his whole life and wants to continue to do that. And we wish you the very best. The book is coming out June 11th. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Call me an American. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm proud that you're an American. You, you are the, the epitome of the American dream. And it can happen even for, for a kid born in South Vietnam and who spent a good part of his life in West Africa. Best of luck to you. We'll be following very closely. Thank you, Michelle. What a what a tremendous opportunity they have in Virginia to send this man to Washington. Uh, Hong Kao, he told you where you can find his website if you want to support him. Uh, and then a book comes out on June 11th. So check it out. I always end my podcast saying be brave and do good. And this gentleman has done both. And do a little bit of it yourself today as well. Thanks for listening.
This is the scariest sound you will hear when you live in a communist country. This is the last sound my parents heard when their fathers were taken away in the middle of the night, and they never saw their loved ones again. That's the sound of losing your freedom, the sound of always living in fear. That's my family's real life story. We escaped from Vietnam just days before Saigon fell to the communists. We were given a new life in the most generous country on earth. America saved my life. I graduated from the United States Naval Academy. I earned a master's in physics and fellowships at MIT and Harvard before the left replaced merit with racial quotas. I spent my life trying to repay my debt to America, my country, our country. With 25 years of service in Navy Special Operations, combat in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Somalia. But now our country has taken a dark turn. That's Joe Biden's Justice Department sending two dozen armed agents to arrest a pro-life activist in front of his family. That's Joe Biden's IRS raiding a gun shop and seizing thousands of records from law-abiding gun owners. Our names, our addresses, our social security numbers. That's Joe Biden arresting his challenger in the next election, a former president of the United States. And now a different sound. That's the sound of someone breaking into your home or business. The sound of crime destroying our cities and communities. That's how it all starts. They let criminals back on our streets. Millions of illegal immigrants pour across our border each year, including military-aged men from all over the world and enough fentanyl to kill every man, woman, and child in this country. And the Biden family? Well, that's how it works in a dictatorship. The rules don't apply to the rulers. We are losing our country. You know it, but you also know you can't say it. We're forced to say that wrong is right. We're forced to lie. We can't let that happen. I've been all over the world. Believe me when I tell you, if America fails, There's nowhere else to go. I'm Hung Kao, retired Navy captain running for United States Senate. I still believe America can be the land of opportunity. I have an obligation to fight back against those who want to control our lives and disrupt our families. We need real fighters, not politicians, not bureaucrats, not keyboard warriors acting tough in a custom-made suit. No, not here in America. We must refuse to be intimidated. We must be fearless. I'm Hung Kao. I'm running for Senate, and I approve this message because I'm not done fighting for us.